Part 1. We specialise in short-term rental. First of all, I would like to get a few details from you. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello, my name is Emiliano. I am a student here and I'd like to rent a house for 6 months. OK, well you've come to the right place. We specialise in short-term rental. First of all, I would like to get a few details from you. Can you give me your full name, please? Yes, it is Emiliano Nespla. And can you tell me your present address, please? Yes, it's 17 Middle Way, Penrose. I'm living with a homestay family at the moment. That's great. Now, do you have any identification with you? Oh, and we will need a reference from someone who knows you here. Maybe your homestay family. Yes, OK. Here's my passport and a card from my language school. My reference can be Mrs. Alice Thompson. She's my homestay mother and she would mind, I'm sure. You can contact her at the same address as me, of course. OK. If we need to contact you, should we leave a message with your homestay? No, you can speak to me directly. My cell phone number is 021-548-3534. Great. Now, do you have a bank account? You will need to pay your rent by direct debit. You know, it will come out of your account automatically every month. OK, I don't have my bank account details with me now, but I can get them and bring them back later today. That's fine. Now, can you tell me what kind of house you are looking for? Do you want to rent by yourself? No, I'm looking for a three-bedroom house. I want to rent with my two friends. I will bring them in to see you later today. OK. And what areas are you interested in renting in? Well, here's a map. Can you see my school? I don't have a car, so I need to take some kind of public transport to school and I don't want to travel for more than 30 minutes each way. Do you think you have anything which is suitable? Yes, we do. Here is a list of available properties. I'll highlight the ones that could be of interest to you. Look at the map and go and have a look at the houses with your friends. Do you have a friend with a car? Yes, I do. Good. So go and look outside the houses. It will give you an idea of what the area is like. But remember, don't go into the garden or knock on the door. If you want to go in and have a look, let me know and we can arrange an appointment. OK. Can you give me an idea of price? Yes. If you look at the list, you can see the weekly rent written next to the house address. Oh yes, I can see it now. Do I need to pay anything else? Yes, you need to pay a deposit which you will get back when you move out and you have to pay a non-refundable agent fee which is equivalent to one week's rent. You will have to pay your bills when they come in every month too, of course. OK, well, thank you very much for your help. What time should I come back with my friends and my bank details? How about 2.30 this afternoon? That sounds good. Thank you for your help. I'll see you later. Thanks for coming in. Goodbye. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Hey, don't throw that can away. Why not? I finished with it. Yes, but you can recycle things like that. Oh, I haven't got time to recycle everything I throw away. That's a terrible attitude. Don't you care about... Hello, you two. Hi, John. What are you arguing about? Oh, Sam says he doesn't have time to recycle. What do you think? Well, I agree that it can be difficult sometimes. Do you always recycle everything then, Mary? Yes, I think everyone should. I mean, look at the state of the planet. If we don't all start making an effort now, it could be too late. 
Well, one of the reasons I don't recycle as often as I should is that I don't really know where to go. There are no recycling facilities near me. Well, I know I said I haven't got time, but actually there is a bottle bank near the supermarket just up the road. So I suppose there are limited local facilities. So you can do your recycling outside the supermarket? Yes, but like I said, only limited. It's only a bottle bank. Well, I don't have a car, so it's very difficult for me, but I still do it. Sometimes a friend comes over and we take our recycling together, but not very often. So if your facilities are limited, then mine are very limited. Well, I suppose if you go to all that trouble, I might make more of an effort. Good. If it was up to me, I'd encourage more people to recycle. How? Well, how about some kind of incentive? A reward for anyone who makes an effort to recycle. That's a good idea. But if you think everyone should recycle, then why not penalise those who don't recycle instead of giving something to people that do? If there was a fine for anyone caught throwing recyclable materials in the rubbish, people would take more notice. Well, now you're going too far. Do you really want anyone going through your rubbish just to check if you're following the rules? No, I don't think fines are a good idea. Well, I think we should be doing something. Anyway, I have to go. I've got my social science class next. See you later. Yeah, see you later. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear an introduction on the housing conditions in Chapmanville. First, look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully. Hi, I'm Gavin Murray. I'm the rental manager for the Central Chapmanville Real Estate Agency. I'm a real estate agent, much like any other, in that I help people buy and sell houses. But about half of my time is spent working to assist people in renting houses and flats. I've been in this business for a dozen years now, and I know the city very well, in terms of which areas are the better places to live and how much it costs to rent in these areas. Now, I normally divide Chapmanville into three areas in terms of rental prices. Generally speaking, the area in the northern part of the city is the low end of the spectrum, the cheapest housing. So if you're looking to spend as little as possible on rent, I suggest you look there. The most expensive area would be the eastern part of Chapmanville. Most people think it's the prettiest part of the metropolitan area because of all the hills and parks. As so many people desire to live there, housing prices tend to be quite high. The middle market in terms of price for accommodation is found in the city's western and southern areas. Now, let me give some examples of how much it will cost you to rent in these areas. Let's imagine you're a single person looking for a one-bedroom flat. In eastern Chapmanville, you would be paying no less than $650 a month for such a flat. You won't find anything for less than that. But a lot of people pay as much as $1,100 per month or more. The higher-priced flats are usually the ones in the hills, which run through the east. They've got the best views of the city. A similarly sized flat in the west of the city and the south, two for that matter, would cost you at most $650. But there are many flats going for less, and if you look around a bit, you can find one for as little as $350. That's quite a reasonable rental price for most people. If you find that too expensive, I suggest you head to Chapmanville's North, where the cheapest flats are to be found. One-bedroom flats there start from about $170 a month and up to about $400. Now, for those of you who want something bigger, 
you'll have to be prepared to pay about double those prices for a small two or three bedroom house. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. For those of you who want something bigger, you'll have to be prepared to pay about double those prices for a small two- or three-bedroom house. That goes for any of the areas I mentioned. OK, so much for prices. What are the advantages and disadvantages of these areas? Well, I told you that the eastern part of Chapmanville is the prettiest. There are lots of parks and lots of trees all around there. Oh, I should mention that the only public transport in the east is the bus. There aren't any trains, so it's not that convenient, as you can imagine, even though it's richer part of the city. In the south, you've also got the river, but you won't find too many parks there, because of all the factories alongside the river. In fact, there's quite a bit of industry in the south, which makes it a less desirable place to live. Still, the south is convenient because of public transport. The South has very good train services to the city centre, as well as buses, and that's why a lot of people choose to live there. I said earlier that western and southern parts of Chapmanville are about the same in terms of the price you pay for accommodation. They also have the same sort of public transport services, but the two areas are quite different in other ways. The west is next to the bay, so it's quite attractive in that sense, but there are a couple of problems with the west. One is that the bay is polluted, so polluted, in fact, that you wouldn't want to swim there. I used to take my family there about ten years ago, but now I wouldn't go near it. The other disadvantage of the West is that it is where the airport is, the Chapmanville International Airport. The noise can be quite annoying. Lastly, the North. In northern Chapmanville, as I said before, housing is cheap, quite cheap, in fact, but you pay in other ways. For example, the area is very low and made up entirely of wetlands. It's beautiful in a way, but it attracts an incredible amount of insects for most of the year. The mosquitoes there are really bad. This makes things quite unpleasant, and so few people have any real wish to live there. But if money's a problem, that's the place to go. Just bring your insect repellent. Let me finish by again welcoming you all to Chapmanville and wishing you good luck in finding accommodation and settling down in whichever part of the city which suits you best. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a tape recording of instructions and advice, which a woman called Martha has left for her friend John, who is coming to stay at her house and take care of it while she is away. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Hello, John. Welcome to the house. I'm really pleased that you can be here to look after my house while I'm away. Here are some things you need to know about the house. Important stuff, like when the garbage is collected. In fact, let's start with the garbage, which is collected on Friday. Just write garbage on the calendar on the days they take it away. 
Put it out on Friday every week, that'll be Friday 22nd, Friday 29th and Friday 5th. It's a really good service. The trucks are quiet and the service is efficient. The bin will be put back outside the house empty. It's a good idea to put it away quickly. This street can be quite windy. I once watched my next door neighbour chase her bin the whole length of the street. Every time she nearly caught up with it, it got away again. The waste paper will be collected this Tuesday. That's Tuesday 19th. There's a plastic box full of paper in the front room. Please put it out on Tuesday. The truck will come during the day. If you don't mind collecting old newspapers and other paper and putting them in the box, I'll put it out when I come home. The paper people only come monthly. I have some things to give to charity in a box in the front room. Would you put it out on Monday the 25th, please? It's a box of old clothes and some bed linen which I've collected, plus a few other bits and pieces. Be careful when you pick it up, because it's heavier than you might expect. The charity truck will come by during the day on the last Monday of the month. If you want to use the library, you'll find it on Darling Street. I've left my borrower's card near the telephone. It has a very good local reference section if you want to find out more about this city. I'm sorry to say we don't have a cleaner. Oh yes, filters. Please would you change the filters on the washing machine on the last day of the month, which is Sunday the 31st. We find that the machine works much better if we change the filters regularly. The gas company reads the meter outside the house, so don't worry about that. I think that's all the information about our calendar of events. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Well, John, I'm trying to think what else I should be telling you. As you know, I'm going to a conference in London. I hope to have a little time to look around. It's a great city. I do hope I manage to get to at least some of the theatres and museums. I'm looking forward to all the things I have to do at the conference too. I'm giving a paper on Tuesday the 26th and there are a couple of really exciting events planned later in the conference programme. I hope to meet up with an old teacher of mine at the conference. She taught English literature at my old high school and we've kept in touch through letters over the years. She teaches now at the University of Durham and I'm really looking forward to seeing her again. By the way, I expect you're hungry after your trip. I've left a meal in the refrigerator for you. I hope you like cheese and onion pie. Would you do me a favour, please? I haven't had time to cancel an appointment. It was made a long time ago and I forgot about it until this morning. It's with my dentist for a check-up on Thursday the 28th. Could you please call the dentist on 816-2525 and cancel the appointment for me? Thanks a lot, John. One last thing. When you leave the house, make sure the windows and doors are shut and set the burglar alarm. The alarm code number is 912. Two zero enter. Have fun. I'll see you when I get back. This is your friend Martha saying goodbye. The end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecturer talking about the solar eclipse in history. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 36.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 36. Good evening and welcome to this month's Observatory Club Lecture. I'm Donald Mackey and I'm here to talk to you about the solar eclipse in history. A thousand years ago, a total eclipse of the sun was a terrifying religious experience. But these days, an eclipse is more likely to be viewed as a tourist attraction than as a scientific or spiritual event. People will travel literally miles to be in the right place at the right time to get the best view of their eclipse. Well, what exactly causes a solar eclipse when the world goes dark for a few minutes in the middle of the day? Scientifically speaking, the dark spot itself is easy to explain. It's the shadow of the moon streaking across the Earth. This happens every year or two, each time along a different and, to all intents and purposes, a seemingly random piece of the globe. In the past, people often interpreted an eclipse as a danger signal heralding disaster, and in fact, the Chinese were so disturbed by these events that they included among their gods one whose job it was to prevent eclipses. But whether or not you're superstitious or take a purely scientific view, our earthly eclipses are special in three ways. Firstly, there can be no doubt that they're very beautiful. It's as if a deep blue curtain had fallen over the daytime sky as the sun becomes a black void surrounded by the glow of its outer atmosphere. But beyond this, total eclipses possess a second more compelling beauty in the eyes of us scientists, for they offer a unique opportunity for research. Only during an eclipse can we study the corona and other dim things that are normally lost in the sun's glare. And thirdly, they are rare. Even though an eclipse of the sun occurs somewhere on Earth every year or two, if you sit in your garden and wait, it will take 375 years on average for one to come to you. If the moon were any larger, eclipses would become a monthly bore. If it were smaller, they simply would not be possible. The ancient Babylonian priests, who spent a fair bit of time staring at the sky, had already noted that there was an 18-year pattern in their occurrence, but they didn't have the mathematics to predict an eclipse accurately. In the second part, the speaker talks about a number of scientists. Look at questions 37 to 40. Now listen carefully and complete the table. It was Edmund Halley, the English astronomer, who knew his maths well enough to predict the return of the comet, which incidentally bears his name, and in 1715 he became the first person to make an accurate eclipse prediction. This brought eclipses firmly into the scientific domain, and they've since allowed a number of important scientific discoveries to be made. For instance, in the eclipse of 1868, two scientists, Janssen and Lockyer, were observing the sun's atmosphere, and it was these observations that ultimately led to the discovery of a new element. They named the element helium, after the Greek god of the sun. This was a major find, because helium turned out to be the most common element in the universe after hydrogen. Another great triumph involved Mercury. I'll just put that up on the board for you now. See, there's Mercury, the planet closest to the Sun, then Venus, Earth, etc. For centuries, scientists had been unable to understand why Mercury appeared to rotate faster than it should. Some astronomers suggested that there might be an undiscovered planet causing this unusual orbit, and even gave it the name Vulcan. 
During the eclipse of 1878, an American astronomer, James Watson, thought he'd spotted this so-called lost planet. But, alas for him, he was later obliged to admit that he'd been wrong about Vulcan and withdrew his claim. Then Albert Einstein came on the scene. Einstein suggested that, rather than being wrong about the number of planets, astronomers were actually wrong about gravity. Einstein's theory of relativity, for which he's so famous, disagreed with Newton's law of gravity in just the right way to explain Mercury's odd orbit. He also realized that a definitive test would be possible during the total eclipse of 1919, and this is indeed when his theory was finally proved correct. So, there you have several examples of how eclipses have helped to increase our understanding of the universe. And now let's move on to the social aspects. And I think you'll. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.